So uh, we're going to open it up for comments I, I, uh, and, and questions. Uh, I urge you to be as, um, uh, as quick as you can uh, uh, so that we can get many voices. Uh, a lot of people are itching to get in on this. So please don't ramble on. If you do, I will tell you you are rambling on. Uh, Baska, you should begin. Uh, he, he, he asked me, he I cheated. Thank <laughs> Thanks for a great presentation. I just wish it had come earlier for us in the conference. Um, it would have helped us in many ways in terms of you know, the way we look at Shanghai. Um, this is really a comment. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to bring up a particular term that I think many of us might find useful. Some of us know this probably. And I'm referring to uh, what uh, many people call a process of subalternization, which um, is sort of derived from Antonio Gramsci's original notion of the subaltern as those people who are extremely marginalized to the point that they have no political voice or agency. Uh, now, people who have since then worked on subalternity and conditions of the subaltern have emphasized that it is, after all, a relational term, which means uh, we often have this tendency to slip into certain kind of stereotypical images of the subaltern, like the refugee, the tribal, the immigrant worker. <coughs> what thinking about it as a process does for us is, analytically, it helps us get away from that pitfall so that we don't assign certain subaltern values like that as a sociological given, but think of it more as a process, which I think was beautifully brought out in their presentation, uh, particularly in the instance of the woman having to move again and again and again, this kind of serial displacement, unending displacement. Uh, her life being taken up by processes in which she has no say. Uh, and that, I think, will be useful this idea of the process of subalternization to think in, uh, as we think about design uh, thinking. And oh yeah, uh, why didn't you make a film while you were at it? <laughs> We'd love to. I think our film would mainly consist of um, empty demolished <laughs> construction sites by now. We'd have to find a whole new series of approaches. But I, but I think your point about the um, about the process is, is absolutely correct. I and mean, what we found that was fascinating when, I, I think designer is not a role that's commonly assigned to the category of subaltern very easily. It's not the way that many people think about, um, about that role. But what we've seen continually is in the face of a kind of inevitability of transformation, um, people stopping things and finding a moment in which they can, w w when they exert a tremendous control over their own spaces uh, and over their own lives, um, and to that extent, Mai, like a number of people, um, to me it's a very Gramscian formulas, formulation, which is um, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, I think it's something like this. Um, so, so even though they know that, that the relocation is inevitable, um, we, we still, you know, in, in, in that time that is available to us, make something that's meaningful and better than what exists now. I really, I really again, wanted to echo, I think, um, the gratitude of many people in the room. I thought that was an amazing presentation. Um, I wanted to ask just one simple question about the divide between research and, and um, practice, which, you know, in the beginning, before you started, we were kind of talking about. And so how does the work that you are doing as ethnographers and geographers inform your practice? You're talking about what you're documenting as architecture without, uh, without architects. You know, being architects, what are the implications? Like, what do you do with this work in your life, professional life? Um, yeah, um, thanks for asking this question because actually this is one um, part of this research that we chose not to talk about today, uh, mainly because we're not really sure quite how, how we want to present it um, or even what it, what it really means to us. But we found that um, we as architects are very interested in looking at ways in which we can be I mean, I think all architects want to do something new. And what we're trying to think about is how can we possibly come up with new forms or new ways to think about architectural operations. That's why we talk about operations a lot here, like 
adding bubbles, infilling, squashing, flattening. Um, that's something that we're interested in and, and sort of comes from uh, education um, at Harvard with Scott Cohen. Um, so when we came here and we saw a lot of these very interesting sort of like formal things happening within the informal building sector, we thought that we could look at them as architectural operations and sort of document them like that, and then perhaps then go away and think about what those things could mean in our practice. Like, for instance, the use of um, the adding in of small buildings within an existing, how do you say, within an existing sort of architectural fabric or within an existing architectural framework. Like you saw this in one of the doorways that we showed earlier, very large sort of doorway entrance into a compound. And um, it was rendered as a sort of interior space with a elaborate coffered ceiling, elaborate moldings, and yet there were these little buildings that were sort of placed within it. Like there's a sort of casualness there, a reinvention of the way that you would think about architecture. Like no, no person really would do anything like that today. Um, no architect would, would really put small little buildings like that within um, a very formalized interior, because it would look, um, well, I don't know, it might look sort of accidental or something, but what we thought was that uh, you could look at that and think um, about coming up with a new, a new language, um, how, we could, um, how we could possibly uh, think about interiors as different kinds of spaces. Uh, you wanna yeah, I, I mean, I think that one of the things that we noticed, um, I mean, it's, it's like a great cliche that necessity is the mother invention of invention, but what, what we started to feel when we were looking around at a lot of these buildings was that there was a lot more inventiveness in architecture that was going on inside, than inside the kind of um, high-end formalized architecture discourse that we were aware of. Sorry, and, and perhaps that, that is because um, in this informal industry, one is freed from the sort of regulations, um, having to follow building codes, having to think about you know, how many square meters can I afford, you know, in this area as opposed to in that area, because in formal building industry, the total amount of area that you can build is, is capped. I mean, everything is tightly controlled in that way. Um, you have to think about the way that services run, for instance, and how you need to hide that within the building fabric, whereas in the informal sector, um, a lot of these things are just sort of very casually um, encountered, and that, that sort of frees us up to think about architectural components that before, if you think about it from a very sort of like formal academic discipline, um, or sort of from like a formal architectural training, you, you don't, you're not free to use these elements in the same kind of way. And so I guess to, to answer your question, have we used any of these things in buildings? Uh, in a way, um, yes and no. Um, not in the sense that we've literally used them, and, and in the way that we've used them, of course, their meanings take on something rather different from, you know, when they're taken out of context and put into a different context. but. Um, some of the general principles um, are, are there. Um, in fact, in the, we were doing one of the houses um, in this infamous Ordos um, uh, village that's being built by Ai Weiwei and other people out in Inner Mongolia. Um, and in that case, it was a very interesting situation because it was the exact opposite. You have not enough people in too much house. I mean, they're building 10,000 square foot houses for families with one child. Um, so. Part of the ingenuity of saying, well, how do you take a certain amount of spatial resources, in this case, shutting part of them down, uh, making, making them different from one another, treating things as different components in ways that you would not normally expect to do um, through the play of scales and through using different elements, where in Ordos, we actually decided that there was enough space for two houses. So we made two houses that one sits on top of the other, um, which is a very strange condition, but it's a condition that we actually saw in one of our sides of apartments. So we're very attuned to that. Um, and, and I think generally looking for a mode of architectural production, which is not necessarily centered on architects working within stylistic norms. Okay, so I've got, <laughs> can you hear me? I've got the talking stick. Um, yeah, can I, if I can just reiterate what a very, very timely intervention. So if I can piggyback somewhat on Julie's uh, question. Of course, uh, I'm an architectural historian and uh, the mention of Venturi, what a great anecdote. But as you're thinking about uh, ways in which you can bring this research into the problem of design, I wonder, is there a danger in becoming another sort of Venturi? Uh, what we've seen today is a first draft of what will be a great book and it will be learning from Shanghai.
in which we reverse the order in which we've been trying to understand Shanghai. The cool, cool house is great, but he's working from sort of the, the macro to the macro. And I think what you're doing is helping us break down the, mic, the macro into the micro. But still, you know, that would leave you with uh, several options as designers. Uh, if this was 30, 40 years ago, you might decide that the thing to do would be to move into advocacy and attempting to, you could say, use your class power as architects to defend the patterns of informal development uh, that you're seeing. The danger maybe is that one can take what you're seeing in, these, uh, in the designs in Shanghai and sort of aestheticizing them so it becomes a sort of slum connoisseurship or a way of, it's a bit like Le Corbusier uh, raving about the, uh, the compactness of the ship's cabin. Uh, this is something else that you could be taking from it, but there are two different types of trajectory that you could go from here once you've presented your research. So that's kind of a comment and a question. This is a more specific question that follows. It's, a, it's another sort of question, which is a detail question. I'm sure you know the photographs of uh, Edward Bertinsky, uh, which is, these are the first things I saw of Shanghai, and you know, they're, they're truly amazing. He titles some of those pictures things like Holdout. And what I was gonna ask you is, uh, can you tell me is it possible to hold out in Shanghai? So when Bertinsky shows you know, an ancient building stuck in the middle of a building site, is it possible in Shanghai to hold out, or are these actually fragments of what has already uh, been displaced? Uh, maybe I'll answer your second qu question first. Um, uh, you know, it, that's an interesting speculation. I don't know of any cases in which holdouts have held out. Um, I mean, there's a real, it's not a David and Goliath situation in many cases. Um, it's about haggling for the right price. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen this amazing photograph. Uh, I think it was from Beijing or from one of the rural cities where there's actually a construction site, an enormous basis at Chongqing, um, where, where in the middle there's one house sitting on a defile of earth that's like 30 feet tall. And what they did was they just begin to construct the entire building around this. Um, and sometimes, even less subtle versions where we've seen uh, on Kangpinglu in the Luan district, there was a house um, where the authorities came every day and removed one row of roof tiles until the people were sort of basically living in the elements. Um, so I, I think that it is very difficult to imagine a situation in which people hold out in the same way. Um, although I think what is beautiful about holding out is the process of making in the context of a lost cause you know, there's really a sense that this house may be gone in six months, but for now, we'll still fix the problems with this house. Um, and I, I don't want to sentimentalize that, but there's something about that I think is a very, very powerful in, in terms of the whole kind of intellectual economy of holding out. Um, so I, to answer the first question, I mean, there's an interesting triangulation. I mean, I, I, I want to tell you what we're trying to avoid. And it's very interesting that you pick, bring up Kulhas. I mean, some of the ways that we developed thinking about this study um, came about in my work for Kulhas. He was my thesis advisor. I know him well. Um, <laughs> too, too well. Um, we don't get along very well. But I, we had a major difference over the question of Lagos. I don't know if you've heard his speech that he gives on Lagos. Um, the speech that he gives from Lagos is unaccredited, but it's the introduction to my master's thesis that I wrote with Gulliver Shepard at Harvard. And our major disagreement was that I felt that in his inevitable drive toward polemicizing and popularizing everything, he was trying to make Lagos into a kind of a utopian condition, um, which was the sort of inevitable future that everyone was going towards. Um, if you want to know originally what the position of that study was, as we wrote it, was that um, an increasing um, statistical percentage of the world's population are now living in slum conditions, and that the responsibility of those studying these conditions is to go and look at the logics of their production and how they're done and how people inhabit them and how people make uh, for better or for worse improvements within the middle of that so that they are neither condemned as slums um, in a very anonymous way, nor are they romanticized. As, you know, Cape Town, I recently saw a book called Shack Chic, which is a kind of a um, architectural digest style photographs of insides of shacks in the Cape Flats, very seriously, and it was selling like stacks. To, uh, to tourists. So my, my concern with this study is not to go neither the one way nor the other, using Kohas as a completely negative example of what we don't want to do. Um, uh, we're not arguing that this, again, is, is a kind of the way that people should go about restructuring urban fabric in Shanghai. But I think that 
what we want to do is to accord it the respect of saying, you know, we would, we would take these drawing techniques and we would go to a famous building and we would draw it to understand it better. So let's take the interior of somebody's home as they've authored it and draw it in the same way so we can learn from it. The larger lessons to be taken from it in terms of holding out, I think um, holding out with dignity is itself uh, a pretty powerful lesson. But I don't, I, I don't want to think of us as turning it into a polemic for informality. But there is also the question of representation. I mean, representation in design is unbelievably violent. I mean, what is terrifying about Shanghai in the course of watching destruction is that you are actually watching architectural drawing operations being enacted on actual buildings. Like when you see a facade removed in the manner of a cross section and you see the paintings still hanging on the walls and the wallpaper and the children's toys lying around, there's a, there's a violence about that which is traumatic and cataclysmic. And at the same time, we acknowledge that in order to step back from, say, photographs, or ethnographic interviews, which of course have their own abstract processes of abstraction, right? They're not in any way neutral forms of recording. Um, that we, we also need to use these to take a look at very complicated types of interiors and just make it clear in a diagrammatic sense to people what they're actually looking at. You know, for example, if you look at Mai's interior, it took us months of looking at it to understand what was, was going on. We had a sense, but, but to, to really understand the details of it required a long dialogue. So what we're trying to do is to use those drawing techniques not for the production of beautiful drawings and not to architecturalize them, but to give them the dignity accorded to ob architectural objects. The same way we would go and draw a cross-section of the Carpenter Center, you know, we would draw a cross-section of Mai's room, but we will also include the photographs, the interviews with Mai that tell us about what she thinks about her room. You know, uh, and hopefully through these we can kind of interpolate a middle ground. But I agree with you, with all these studies, the problems of architectural representation linger. And we haven't found a way to obviate those completely. Um, thank you for this really illuminating presentation. Um, so I have two questions, both of which will be brief. Um, first, I was wondering if, um, in your examination of these different living spaces, if you also noticed different uses for household appliances. For example, um, you mentioned the bathtub. Um, I was wondering if the bathtub was actually used for bathing because when I've seen them before in Shanghainese apartments, um, it doesn't seem like anyone really takes a, like, a bath in these bathtubs. And um, I've seen like um, kitchen supplies like stacked in these bathtubs. Um, the second question is also, um, Given um, the spaces of these apartments and the relatively small size of them, as well as sometimes the number of people who are living in these apartments, um, do, is the way um, that the external space or the outside thought of differently, um, and not just like an extension of, you know, a kitchen area or something um, um, right outside of the house, but is the city itself thought of um, differently? Um, or an extension of somehow like the private space, um, given the crowded nature of these uh, living spaces. Well, one unfortunately, is this is this on? Okay. I mean, one of the parts of the book which is our favorite, which we did not really present today because it's by itself a very long lecture and requires a lot of kind of um, historical background. Um, I think would speak more to your second question, which is this question of um, public and private and of uh, an urban experience of uh, turning inside out, um, where a lot of the functions of um, the public wind up in the interior and the functions of what would be associated with a domestic interior wind up outside. Um, in part, this has to do with the history of lane housing itself and its uh, sanitary facilities, which by itself is an amazing, th there's a book called um, Beyond the Neon Lights by Han Chao Lu, um, which is an amazing study, for example, I mean, he, it's, it's like almost um, like pornographically obsessive, like he wants to know exactly what shapes were the chamber pots and where did you put them when they were filled versus not, but it's all about the sort of the management of privacy in spaces that didn't have formal sanitary equipment. Um, and J.G. Ballard also has written about this a little bit about, in, uh, recently there was an article in Harper's, um, this amazing account of the kind of waste that you saw on the street in Shanghai. But, but what we noticed um, was an amazing sort of inversion that was taking place where because of illicit trades, um, the whole fake culture, which is basically what this chapter in our book is about, is like how fake culture, which everyone knows is there, which is to a certain extent tolerated even though it has to occasionally be spectacularly um, slapped on the wrist, 
Um, these things that are major public spaces in China but are relegated to building interiors because they can't exist on the street in any simple sense. Um, and that there is an entirely occluded public realm which happens in interiors. And we have a series of drawings of buildings where very elaborate kind of Scooby-Doo mechanisms have been used to kind of um, separate a fake, fake, a fake real shop in the front from a real fake shop in the back, which is the DVDs or handbags or whatever else, and how that's done using architecture of the Lane House um, and all of the kind of very complicated gradations of um, privacy and publicity that happen along the, the sort of bronchial network of lanes. But what we thought was really amazing is that when you will go past a room in a lane where somebody is basically taking a shower or washing their clothes right at the lane side and then go through a tiny private door and inside is a room where 40 people who've just gotten off the plane from Hong Kong are buying handbags in the back space of the, through a dark alleyway. So I think that in the sense of normative urban ordering, like a sort of ideal modernist urban ordering where you, know, you zone things and they're private areas and the roads are public and the facades are a mediating function between the public and the private and the private holds private functions, you can apply a lot of those um, types of thinking to Shanghai. But what you get in return is a very amazing series of smaller scale negotiations. Um, so the whole sense of like the, the hidden public and then the public hidden you know, is something that's really a big part of the project that we're very interested in. Um, and what it what happens in the middle, we find, is that that embellishment, that thickening of the facade, where the facade no longer plays the role of representing the building, but is a kind of a sponge-like entity that, that um, negotiates between the two, like a kind of a, an epidermis through which things <laughs> cross one way or another, um, is a very important part of that. Um, I'm very interested in the images of demolition sites you have shown to us, and because it's partly related to my work on waste architecture and urban ruin. Um, as we all know, the radical urban transformation in China the last 20 years have produced a tremendous uh, waste architecture and architecture waste. Um, and the common assumption is these uh, demolition sites uh, is a temporal pause and a spatial pause in the city and nothing is going on um, in it. I uh, just waiting to be eradicated and to build something new. But what you have shown is a new set of social and economic relationship has um, formulated around the sites and the, um, e even some architectural ways like the facade you have shown has been rendered something useful. And could you just talk about um, how these uh, ruins and demolition sites have mutated into kind of new architectural life um, after it has been demolished. Um, yeah, um, I think we were talking earlier about that one hoarding that uh, we showed on, was it Fusinglu or Rimutilu? Uh, the demolished old house that um, now stands, its street wall is basically now the hoarding for a development that was supposed to take place. I mean, the demolition took place in 2003, 04, but we just passed it just now, and it's, it's still a construction site. But then there's an amazing sort of economy um, that is employed there because you don't bother building a new hoarding where there is the existing party wall of, a, of an existing building, and in fact, they use the front door of the old house as the entrance into the construction site. So um, you see things like that, and then also um, what we were showing you earlier, some pictures of this meticulous gathering and orga organizing of component construction elements like the bricks that were salvaged one by one and then stacked up and sold on, or the timber. All these things happen because of, um, I mean, because of the sort of functional need of it. They happen on the site usually usually on the site itself, perhaps in an old um, building, maybe the ground floor room that, you know, it forms part of, of the extents of that block. And um, the migrant, the, not the migrant, sorry, the workers that are there, they, they temporarily live in those accommodations while the sales are taking place. And as soon as they're done with that, they move on to the next one. Um, there are frequently so many of these sites um, being demolished at the same time that the demolition company that has several branches that they dispatch to different sites and they have to continuously keep moving. So this is like a um, sort of, I mean, it's a continuous industry that's happening now still. Um, do you want to talk? And, I mean, I think one other thing that uh, we, didn't, we didn't really get into very much, but you know, when, when, when we were trying to understand the framing of that particular part of the study, the question is, I mean, how do you, 
how do you begin to conceptualize the experience, the kind of the phenomenology of living among destruction at such an enormous scale? I mean, some of these areas which we were showing, but I mean, that, those tracks, those swaths of destruction go on for square kilometers. I mean, you know that they're very, very large. Um, so we were sort of starting to read David Harvey's stuff on, you know, um, creative destruction or the, the, the inherently kind of destructive <laughs> renewal tendency. Um, we didn't find it terribly satisfying, but um, there was some amazing work. Um, I think it's still unpublished, but it's to be published by Nancy Munn, um, the anthropologist who writes about the phenomenology of a similar moment in New York. I mean, one of the things that's really important to remember about informal cities is that they have a tendency to formalize themselves. I mean, this is the way that New York became a formalized city, and this is happening throughout Africa in very interesting kinds of ways as well. Um, but what she was writing about was a moment when large mansions were being destroyed in New York to be replaced with larger tenement blocks so that the, um, the, the kind of econometrics of development could be maximized um, for the developers. And what she was talking about was this phenomenology of people who would go and revisit buildings in various stages of removal. So they would go when the facade was taken down, they'd go when the structure came down, they would go back when it was an empty site, they'd go back when the new building was being built. And there's a certain element of that here where we would sort of continually revisit the same sites of destruction to try and um, kind of look for nuances, like to what, to what threshold were indications of inhabitation allowed to stay. One of the things that blew our minds was the fact that you would still see people's photographs on the wall as you look through a gaping hole into a second floor apartment um, that was still partially there because somebody in the next room refused to move out. Um, so they would kind of bring the, the destruction closer and closer and closer and closer to the party wall where people were living and they would stop. But, um, but it's a very interesting conceptual question is how, how do these things, um, these particular sites live on while there is simultaneously all of this um, activity, but also a kind of a moment where the site is always changing and a kind of um, final moment of destruction. Well, it's a question quite similar to what uh, Ju Julie and Simon uh, have asked. Well, well, I think one way to summarize your presentation is that, well, it is designed from the low or designed from everyday life, right? Well, you know, like Simon what have said, is that when I saw your presentation, well, the image in my mind is uh, when, when, when Chewie spoke, right? Le learning from Las Vegas. And your project is almost like how can we learn something from, from Shanghai? So let's put me, I'm less critical as Simon. I, let's assume we can learn something from Shanghai. Then my question really is, what can we learn? rather than a kind of nostalgic, exalted reading of this localized design in Shanghai. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I would like to actually underscore, I think, a very big difference in our minds between ourselves and Venturi and between what we're doing and learning from Las Vegas. I think, in part, it has to do simply with the subject matter that we're studying. I mean, learning from Las Vegas was about looking at a very particular um, crass economy of architectural communication, which he was then trying to, in a very chic way, redeem you know, for the artistic intelligentsia, right? Um, I'm not sure about that project. I have concerns about that. Although I know that architects are constantly, you know, Frank Gehry is basically going back to <laughs> John Jurdy and to the malls that he was working on for Victor Gruen in Los Angeles, and he was making them cool, and we know that architects do that. Um, Coolhouse's work, in, to a huge extent, borrows from um, any number of kind of commercial architectures, uh, the, the Portmans of the world and so on. So th there's an exchange there that I think is very particular uh, and is not the same as the kind of exchange we're seeing here. I think also that um, my critique, I actually do not like Learning from Las Vegas as a book. I think Complexity and Contradiction is the best book written about architecture, um, probably since 1950, but I think that Learning from Las Vegas hammers through one point over and over again, which is that architecture is communication. And that's true insofar as it's true, and it's true until it's false. I mean, I think that even in Las Vegas, um, architecture exceeds what Venturi says that it does. So what we're trying to avoid, um, what, what I would like, I think, I think what we would like to do is replicate Venturi's energy in engaging a context. What we'd like to do is to avoid drawing singular lessons from what that context gives you. And I think the radical heterogeneity of Shanghai does not allow you to come out with the conclusions that are anything like Venturi would draw from learning from Las Vegas. There is flattening, but as we've just demonstrated, there is also the expansion of flat surfaces into three-dimensional surfaces. You know, there are any number of architectural inventions that are, first of all, socialized and not being perpetrated like huge ducks um, where you buy hamburgers or whatever. Uh, and I think that um, our goal would be to look at the lessons, but also understand that they're also a multivocal uh, undertaking, which is to say that we are letting or trying to um, let as many of the different participants in this undertaking speak for themselves um, and not like Venturi to kind of translate it all through a kind of a safe architectural jargonization where we weaponize their language and, 
we present it for, for people like us. It's, it's extraordinary. I think the question is maybe if we can connect this directly to design right here and, and just draw on your experience. Uh, and this is because somebody brought me to this, what's called the only carbon neutral hotel in Shanghai. This place called we, URBN. I don't we know, know, we know personally the perpetrators of that hotel. Okay, <laughs> so this is why I bring it up because you've got all this experience here. Um, but what you see in that garden, you see, I don't know if they are roof tiles or there's some materials. I didn't, I didn't know if they were recycled or not, but it crossed my mind at the time. And what you've introduced with this recycling of the wood and the materials is really interesting for a number of reasons, mm. uh, only one of which is to say, do you think it's influenced design of the city right yeah. now? And, and could you say more about that? Um, I think it has differentially. I mean, my guess is that when you see these... Um, the vast scale of kind, of kind of these tower developments, um, those are, I mean, we, we um, as landscape architects often, we don't, we don't build big projects. We only build small projects. That's our thing. Um, but we do provide landscapes for some of these larger scale projects. And um, Singapore has an enormous initiative now to try and use recycled materials. And the interesting thing about using recycled materials is it's very difficult to do. It's hard to find the materials when they use it. They don't meet testing specifications that the construction authorities will allow you to. So uh, my guess is that on, on that scale, it's, you will not see a lot of recycling. But what? Sorry, also, I'll yeah. just interrupt. I mean, it, on that scale, the recycled materials are quite a few steps removed from the kinds of recycling that we are seeing here, which is a direct reuse of old ducts or old floorboards. But when we talk about using recycled materials, a lot of times the concrete is recrushed and then reprocessed and then formed into new concrete or blocks. Steel, which or steel, steel is steel. always recycled. Um, there's, there's no steel that's not recycled. Um, and that's a subject of a lot of interesting studies of where China gets its steel and how do they manage to produce it. Um, but I, I think that with a younger generation here, but also globally, there are conditions where the people are looking at what's going on in Cape Town uh, in the way that, for example, um, trash is reused in a series of craft products through very interesting kinds of social um, um, production cores. And, um, and they are starting to use that. We're seeing that a lot in Singapore where now there's a lot of emphasis on the younger generation of designers who are doing small projects to, to use recycled things. Um, that particular hotel does not use any recycled material. What they did was they offset it by pretending to buy carbon credits. Um, so there, and by not washing your sheets for four days. Um, so, you know, there, there is, I think, you know, there's always an, an element of greenwashing, um, which is a term that we have to be very careful about nowadays um, because there's a difference between perceptual and real ecologies. Um, but I think, that, I, I, I think that if you were to look at what happens and, and sort of the foothills of these mountains that are being built, you'll see a lot of that starting to, to happen. And we do know of people who, I mean, um, people who are renovating beautiful flats or are building new flats, but they're putting in old floors. So this kind of thing does happen. It just doesn't happen at the condo scale. It will happen slightly more in the kind of loft style of, of development that we see. Yeah, sorry. And also there's, there's a whole element that actually way um, um, sort of brought up to me just now, um, a lot of these recycled materials are used by, I mean, these direct purchases are used by individuals who are constructing their own homes and also a lot by migrant workers. I mean, a lot of the wood, a lot of the old wood, the bad quality wood um, is bought by migrant workers for their temporary housing. Um, so along with all this, you know, very fast paced development of these new buildings, there's also, there has to be along with it, um, construction of temporary housing for all the workers, all the millions of workers that come into the city outskirts and, and um, they need their temporary homes, which they move and relocate as new construction takes over their, their land. So um, there is also this sort of slightly invisible because we don't, see, we don't see the migrant worker housing because we don't, you know, we don't go there, but all that is happening and all that, all that is usually built with recyc direct recycled materials. But just, uh, just one, one point you just brought up initially, I, I think that's worth um, underlining and reiterating, is that it's not, we don't want to put the emphasis on decay uh, or on destruction. I mean, this is where, I, I always feel like we are continually having conversations with Ashil and Bembe in which we shout from one hemisphere and he shouts back from the other, but we never seem to be in the same place. But I think the question about like decaying and surging is a very interesting thing, where there is... In all of this, there is a sadness about loss, but at the same time, there are extraordinary ways where at each particular moment, a loss is converted into an opportunity. Um, and it's, you know, we saw that, again, studying in Lagos, where, you know, a six-hour car jam 
um, turned into a mobile marketplace where you know on the way home you bought everything, um, and and I think that those those sorts of um, Temporary mobilizations that happen at every single scale and at every instance in the process um, are, are really worth noting because the destruction and the creation are interlinked to a point where in some cases we can't tell one from the other. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the um, human behavior behind some of these changes like um, the additions of beds in storefronts. Um, my understanding is that a lot of times people don't actually live there. They might have a home in some other part of the city. Um, and so they sleep in their business like to protect their business. Um, or if you could talk a bit about what might be driving that. Um, or why don't they just have a mat on the floor? Um, and also the Mr. Mox home, he had all those things on display and how how does he entertain? Do people actually come over and see these things he has on display? And you mentioned in the other family's home, I think it was the Ma family, um, that she had her more prettier dishes on display. So mm. are those really for show for outsiders? Like how, in these small spaces, how public are these small spaces? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just talk first about the sleeping. Um, it's very interesting. Um, we were, there's a case that we didn't show, um, a case of a grain, a grain shop, the Jew family. Um, has a grain shop that basically um, it's a one bedroom, it's a one room home, it's tiny, it's probably, I don't know, about 10 feet by 10 feet and there, th there were five or six of them living there until the, the older generation passed away. So now it's just Mr. Drew and his wife and his son and um, you know because they were laid off and they had nothing to do but they owned this home, they decided to sort of convert the front of it into a grain store where they make enough money only to go and buy their vegetables, but nothing else. So he says it's okay because it just helps him to pass the time. But what was interesting about that place was that they gave over most of the space to a shop, which doesn't do anything for them but help them pass the time. So the sleeping portion of their life um, became, they decided to build a loft, much like what we'd seen earlier, in order, which is where they would sleep. Um, it was sort of just talked about as a very, I mean, it's just a perfunctory thing. You need to sleep, so you build a little area where you go and sleep, but most of the day is conducted in the shop and actually on the sidewalk um, where they would lay out their, you know, a mahjong table. They had all their pets out there, their garden. Um, and what was, what was interesting about it also, we talked about, we, we, saw, we noticed that there were these two cupboards um, that were sort of stuck to the top um, of the two edges of the wall, and they were maybe three feet, two and a half feet deep and maybe two and a half feet wide. So they look like cupboards. And he said, yeah, we built these as cupboards, but you know, we've got nothing to store, so our son sleeps in one of them. So it, we, we get that a lot. I mean, people, um, when we go to Paolo, for instance, a lot of the workers actually sleep in some of those dining rooms. So you'll notice that some of the storage on the side is their sleeping mats. They'll sleep there at night, and then they will roll them up, and it becomes a dining room during the day. So they, they, don't, they don't tend to go home because actually Shanghai, I forget what it is, the official size of the city is 13 million, but actually how many are there? I mean, it's insane. I mean, it's like, I don't know, in the 20s. So a lot of these people really, they don't have places to, to go home to. But one thing that your question raises, it's an important comment, and I think it's worth thinking as, you know, when, when we take these kinds of empirical lessons and we try and come to other kinds of theoretical conclusions, having looked really at what's going on on the ground a little bit, um, is the question of why do people not just throw a mattress on the floor? I mean, why do people like Mr. Mock, and by the way, to answer your question, Mr. Mock is a very kind of solicitous <laughs> character. And basically what he does is he goes out and he talks to people in the park or wherever else he'll come by and just says, hello, and he brings them home and he tells them about himself. Um, and I think in part, that in that there was a kind of a tragic, I think a kind of a neurosis about somebody who is, has had the gift of longevity um, and has lived through this massive experience of China in the 20th century and no one has written down anything that he's experienced. And um, part of our desperation with like kind of setting up meetings to see him was because he was so elderly and we wanted to make sure that he had a chance to talk and he wanted to make sure that he had a chance to talk. Um, but what he really wanted to do was talk. And actually what we found was very interesting with a lot of people, we have never had an experience walking around, except for one case where there was a really crazy person. We've never had an experience of somebody said, get out of here, what are you doing, why are you objectivizing, why are you looking at our stuff? Why? You know, people were just, they were often bemused that we were not down the street looking at the portman, um, and they wanted to know why we weren't interested in looking at the portman. Um, 
and in fact, we of course we were interested in looking at the Portman, but the but the fact was that people were, were thought it was kind of naturally interesting that people would come and ask them questions and were incredibly open about the kinds of answers that they gave, um, and there was a lot of um, a lot of house pride and a lot of humor about describing these kinds of environments. Um, but what we noticed was that in many cases, most cases. Um, there was always an attempt to order one's spatial surroundings and order one's uh, object worlds into something that was like a domestic order or a commercial order or something. People very rarely simply threw something on the floor and said, okay, I'm going to sleep here now. A lot of the times when they described their living accommodations, it had to do with, you know, well, I sleep here because I get up at seven and I have my tea there and I do this, I do that. You know, it's, it's much more about the establishment of, of routines and orders that allow them to live in a place that I think allows it to be an inhabited place as opposed to a merely occupied place. Um, and I think that distinction is very interesting in the context of a city that's continually destroying and rebuilding itself because we started to notice that, you know, I, this is true, I don't know if it's true now, we haven't looked around much, so we only got in last night, but um, there used to be these enormous condominium developments which couldn't be sold for various reasons. I mean, either complications in the funding of the project or so, and so migrant workers were living in them. And you would drive past these, you know, 40-story mountain ranges that occasionally had one of these pairs of underwear stretched to abstraction on a hanger, like in the corner, or, you know, whatever, but, but they, were, they were occupied. They weren't inhabited, but they were actually, and the word occupation always was interesting because the people that were building it were also living in it, right, at least for this temporary window. But then elsewhere in conditions of, uh, at the other end of the spectrum of where you would imagine the greatest lack, people were taking the greatest care to organize their possessions in a way that made them inhabitable. Um, and that, so I, th I think that in a way that was a question we were asking ourselves as well. Hello, uh, my question is about the forced uh, displacements you mentioned. Um, you talked about that mostly in negative terms, you know, people are resisting that. Last week we heard some stories from Michael Keith about how in some cases people profit off of this or they get enough money to buy multiple flats and just being in Shanghai for a while anecdotally I've heard stories that people desire in many cases their home to be taken down so they can get compensation from the government so I was just wondering if you could talk a little more about that you know have you encountered situations where people have that desire to be relocated and also yeah, about for sure. forms of resistance and the response to the resistance mm -hmm. Um, forms of resistance we know less about. I mean, we've heard about some anecdotally. There is an industry in Shanghai um, whereby um, people move into buildings that they know are going to get demolished and they try and establish common law ownership over an area or they pay to move in because they know that the payout is going to be greater. I mean, it's a kind of, it's like property development for the squatter, you know, in a way, is that they, they kind of constantly get a, a larger scale. And I'm sure some people have amassed kind of enough money to go and buy a nice house somewhere by doing that. I think that also, there are cases where, you know, as I've said before, it's, we don't want to sentimentalize this. I mean, these collectivized interiors are hard to live in. And I think when people especially reach a certain age threshold, sometimes they say, this is, this is enough. I, just, I don't care where I am. I just want to be somewhere with a you know, proper heating system. Um, and so I, I, would, I would guess, as with everything else in Shanghai, that you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 opinions. You know? But I, in, our, in our experience, um, what what did keep people when they wanted to stay was the sense that they had histories and extensive social networks in particular places and that they were place bound. And that even while these um, places were being destroyed, what was interesting was noting that the scale of their place associations were sort of growing slightly wider in a kind of concentric series of circles. So like a particular block would be destroyed and they'd say, oh, it's a, I'll move somewhere else within this district. And then the district, you know, available housing would be destroyed. They say, ah, at least I'm still in the French concession. <laughs> you know, so I mean, there, there's this kind of like expanding of the horizons inevitably that sort of takes place. Um, we have seen cases of holdouts uh, and people have held out for a long time. You know, inevitably, sooner or later, people are evicted one way or the other, usually because there's an amazing moment where their surroundings are destroyed to a point where they barely have a few beams. Of it. It's like there are a few threads on your shirt and that's what's left. Um, and at a certain point, I think you can... You can kick out anybody you want to kick out. Um, so that that's kind of comes back to the question of holding out, which is very interesting. And what, what we always assumed is that nobody holds out forever, but that the process of holding out was very interesting. So there was a house again on Kung Ping Lu. They would, they would remove these roof tiles, right? And so what you were getting were beams and then a fully beautifully tiled roof, which was kind of disappearing toward one side. And what the people did is every day they come and remove one roof tile. So the people would come in and shift all their furniture one roof tile over. And then they come and remove it and they shift it until eventually like everything is stacked up one wall 
all, you know? So there is a kind of an interesting, I mean, it's, it shouldn't be funny, but I mean, there's, there's a, there is a kind of an interesting cat and mouse game that happens around a lot of those. But sooner or later, I think, um, you know, in the end, all of these buildings do come down. Uh, in the spirit of your project, I'd like to uh, pick up one detail that you meant, uh, that you presented in the Ma House, Ma House, uh, that phrase "time is money," uh, the, uh, which seems uh, uh, unusual for a guy who has been worked for many years. And I think one gloss on that would be this uh, uh, remark by um, uh, the sociologist uh, Sigmund Bowman when he says, uh, "The the rich have." Um, the rich have space but no time, and the poor have time but no space. Mm -hmm. right? So the rich uh, 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 travel around, but they're always busy like a lot of us. Uh, but the, the poor have all the time in the world, but they live in these cramped conditions. And this seems to be another way of reading the, that note in the house, time is money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't mean, I think, uh, as it usually means, uh, 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 time is in a relationship of exchange with money, right? Rather, it means time is something that you have to value, right? Oh, yeah. Time, time is this value which which is there, and I think this leads to um, a couple of other points which I want to go into. Which is, uh, I thought one of the things you did in this presentation was to raise, as David said, this whole question of design and necessity, but necessity not simply in a in a popular sense and not in any romanticized sense. Uh, it's maybe you could call it uh, subaltern design or design from below or design without uh, designers, but I think it's probably a little bit more complicated than that because uh, design here uh, doesn't have, uh, necessity here doesn't have something necessarily grim to it. Mm. Right? Because necessity also includes, yeah. uh, for example, all these other things which are necessary. Like, for example, the plants, the, the decoration, Absolutely. the, yeah. the autobiography, mm -hmm. right? Where, where you write your space as your own space, even under these very uh, cramped conditions. And this, I think, leads to a, a third point, which is the, the way in which um, uh, these conditions that we see in Shanghai, of course, as you know, are not unique. I mean, the, we've seen them before in Hong Kong, for example, in, in, uh, in Taipei and elsewhere. But it's like uh, there's a kind of historical moment when these, uh, you know, these designs and, and these activities take place. Mm. Uh, it's like the moment of the fake, for example. Right? At one point, it was Japan. At another point, it was Taipei. At the third point, it was Hong Kong. Now, it's, uh, it's China. So the fake, like these things that we're seeing, are like historical markers. Right? They're markers maybe of, of a certain moment of, uh, of, uh, of global development, which I, I think would be uh, also an interesting one. One last point would be, I thought it was also very good the way in which you went from uh, a comparatively simple example uh, of uh, a, 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 an interior to a much more complicated example of, of the restaurant, where the, I think the interesting thing there was the, the same kind of design thinking, shall we say, Right, was being applied. So it's not just a question of learning from Shanghai. Right? I, think, I think you're quite right there. It's not learning from Shanghai. It's really a question of, uh, of rethinking uh, 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 the possibilities of design under different conditions. So you're, this restaurant, where some of the principles of, as you say, flattening, right? but the way in which you know, the flat now takes on volume. Right? The, the, the way in which flatness can take on volume and then leads to a different mode of, uh, of design thinking, I think. And this is where I thought your, your presentation was really very uh, timely, because this was where we were, some of the issues we were trying to get at. And I, I think that what you're saying is exactly right. I mean, we've always seen this as a logic of production. Um, but I mean, again, going back to learning from Las Vegas, I think that even the title suggests a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a unity of conclusions. You know, that there's something to learn from Las Vegas. I mean, we would never have a book called Learning from the World, right? And and Sh Shanghai, to me, is you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't describe a project as learn. I mean, we are learning from Shanghai, but there are not lessons that we take uh, in the sense of a playbook. You know, this is this is really. I mean, what's interesting about the Paulo example is that it really is that sense of. Um, the, the, the 
the triangulation between space, time, and money, and the conception of necessity as including dignity and order, um, then become a kind of a way, a sort of a nexus of operations where we see different people pursuing similar techniques. But I think that that is what's very interesting here, and, that, and part of the theorization of architecture, to me, always becomes much more interesting when you get it away from architects. It take, take it out of this sort of humanistic, uh, you know, great man making buildings kind of thinking, and, and look about how it is produced within a, a kind of a nexus of social thought, which will generate similar reactions to different problems in different places that nonetheless speak to each other in sort of a common logic. And I think that's what has been really revelatory and exciting about this project is to see the extent to which um, people do that um, and to, to the energy with which they, they engage it. Um, and I think that what it does is if I look at this cluster of very valid questions, it kind of tends to shift the theoretical emphasis um, back toward the social and then away from design as a kind of a magical undertaking that improves or, or fails to do so. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about um, the elsewhere and the imaginary um, and connecting to the elsewhere. I think you had two examples in your presentations and there was one uh, where the facade uh, had an image of sort of the new construction site, um, Pudong, or like the sort of that, that new landscape and, and designs, urban design space of Shanghai and like the person was sleeping inside the facade and had like a little loophole, but on the outside there was sort of the connection or perhaps even the imaginary of this other kind of urban, urban space that was visible there. And the other example was perhaps Mr. Matt's uh, connection to abroad. You mentioned, I think, his family is also living yeah, abroad. Yeah, his nieces and, and nephews uh, overseas. Yeah. His nephews, yeah. okay. So I was really interested in these connections and this particularly local sites that you guys were looking at, sort of this really, the micro, the connection to perhaps the, the local imaginary of the new urban landscape, but then even to the sort of more farther away imaginary, like the abroad, wherever his, his nephews, for example, live. What, what, what kinds of connections are being made between those places elsewhere? How, how do people transition perhaps back and forth? Do his, does it, do his family members visit him and how is it for them to return? If it is a return, I don't know. Um, I mean, the, there are, I'm sure there are many, 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 many ways in which those, those connections take place. And what was very interesting, um, when we were here at this time, of course, um, this, this has been a process that's been going on be well, for a long time before we, we got here and started talking to people, but there was really a sense that, um, that Shanghai was, had all of a sudden, very forcibly, been pushed to the center of the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's like, the thing that it reminds me of is, you know, I grew up in, around University of Chicago, and then, you know, when Obama went up to the White House, it was like, Hyde Park was suddenly the center of the world, you know? I mean, there was this, like, where it would always been kind of ignored and at the periphery and kind of grumpy about it. But I think what was amazing was how um, assertively and imaginatively people engaged that shift to the center um, and understood themselves as being part of sort of not just networks to people, but also to all kinds of iconography that had to do with connecting things that you make here, spaces, restaurants, you know, uh, food, all these things to, to a kind of a global world that appeared to be organizing itself very, um, uh, uh, with great cupidity around China, you know, and in a great sort of sense that China was something that had to be engaged. Um, a lot of cases we found that um, people who were living in Shanghai in a lot of these areas had actually sent their children overseas or had, had brothers and sisters who had migrated overseas and um, were maintaining through all kinds of um, you know, virtual means, you know, a kind of a dialogue about what was going on in Shanghai versus what was happening overseas. And what was interesting is that they would describe how much interest people overseas had about what was going on in Shanghai. So it wasn't necessarily the sense of, oh wow, we now have access to the world, but it's like, oh wow, the world is now really interested in what's going on in Pusi, you know, which is really interesting. Um, so there, I mean, there was really to us always a sense of participation in a global, you know, always. Um, and that, the kind of ways in which China's production economy all of a sudden is being part of every single international production chain in the world and, and having all of this kind of flood and flow of commodities and things from around the world was all of a sudden made, made that point very material and I think very clear to people. So there was no way, I mean it was like, it was kind of a funny, it was like walking around in Arjuna Padurai's brain or something. It was like everywhere you went, it was like, oh, global, oh, local. You know, you know, there's this kind of, it's to the point where, 
you know, where, where, where one had to acknowledge what was happening was that the engagement was so intense that, um, you know, that, that, it, there, that there was no way of kind of distinguishing anymore between, between these things. And a lot of the times, like, um, what was great was the, the manager at Paolo who kept saying that he wouldn't hire a chef. His chef, he said, oh, he's the oldest. He's so old. And he's too old to be a chef. We said, how old is he? He said, he's 38 years old. And we said, well, why wouldn't you? He said, no, because, you see, there's no such thing as Shanghai. So Shanghai is this thing where Shanghai invents itself. It has to reinvent itself every five years. Shanghai takes from here. This building is French. That building is Chinese. We put it all together. You know, so an old man, all of a sudden, he's going to get stuck in his ways, and he's not going to be Shanghai anymore because Shanghai is about youth and remaking these things continually. So that sense of kind of assemblage, I think, was a term that was brought earlier. Bricolage was always there, and, but it was understood now as being a historical value of the place that had simply been put on hold for about 50 years. Um... You talk about the, the pockets of availability. Sorry? Pockets of availability. Yeah. Um, this kind of um, take advantage of the opportunity. And in, in other days of this seminar, we talk about uh, how sometimes like these big developments also have to make use of, of windows of opportunity in the regulation, because sometimes regulation change so fast and how um, also, like, whenever you get through the bureaucratic kind of uh, desert, so you have to really take advantage. So, do you see any kind of, do you think that this kind of uh, opportunistic attitude can bridge the macro and the micro, in a way? That, I mean, that's, that is a really interesting question, and it's, it's one that we keep, coming back to is the question is, what are the scale that we're talking about? I mean, when people make these interventions, is it really just fiddling around inside old buildings and then getting kicked out? Or is there a sense that, that this can? But what we always had a sense, and I, I would love to find a political economist who can actually make this you know, clearer for us in the Shanghai case, but there was always a very, a very promiscuous sense of relationships across scales. You know, I mean, often... Like, for example, the conditions that would allow people to stay in a certain place longer than they thought they would be able to had to do with connections to people uh, in positions of authority, you know, or they had to do with negotiating something with a developer who would allow them to stay on a piece of land longer if they could get somebody in a different location to agree to move out, you know. So there were ways in which a kind of a, it was like a sort of aquatic condition where there were, there were a lot of kind of flows of, um, connections and negotiations that allowed for things that we would have thought would be impossible to actually happen and would allow for people to hold out longer, for example. Um, but it often occurred to us through these kind of uh, very mysterious and hard to access kinds of negotiations that people would make about um, the way that spatial resources were management. So for example, the way that um, a block organization uh, in an area that was about to be demolished could undertake negotiations with people who were then about to take over that land. Um, it could happen in any number of different ways, but it had very material consequences for the people that were staying, that they were allowed to stay longer or they were compensated a certain amount, you know? Um, and, you know, it, it's an interesting question to know to what extent that penetrates the, you know, <laughs> the, the realms of power. Because there might be a common notion of the precarious. Yeah. You know, like of not control and... Well, that, I, think, I think these things are always um, understood as being, you know, it's that the time is money in a way is about, you know, it's a different conception of, t I mean, time is like, how much time do I have left? It's like negotiating with somebody who has very little left and has to marshal out the remaining resources. And I think that, that yeah, the sense of, the, sense of um, the fragility of that existence um, of its material fragility as well as uh, its social fragility. I mean, when these places are destroyed, the amount of social infrastructure that is scattered at the same time, I mean, I don't want to make that sound too functionalist, but like the, the relationships between people that have become invested in, you know, we, we went to a house, for example, where it was uh, a Dunway that worked in marine industries and it was dissolved, not really dissolved, it was kind of re conditioned and privatized into a government-linked company in the 1980s. And at the same time, all of its employees over a certain age were booted off to a house where they, where they used to work. And so they were living there as sort of proud members of a former Dunway, which was now occupying a sort of glassed-in office space on Huai Hai Lu and was doing really well in big business. Thank you very much. And um, so there, there, was, there were these kind of really interesting moments where 
everything changes, you know? Everything that was, like the former administrators of this company are now retired and the company has become a company and it's moved elsewhere. So this, the sense um, that we got very often was a belief that anything can change. I mean, there was a... Um, it's more like a, a, um, a comment than a question. Um, because earlier you mentioned the slums and I really sort of fascinated because it sort of reminded me of Mike Davis talk about, you know, the, uh, the planet and the slum, the surplus yeah. humanities. And, and sort of suddenly sort of think about the typologies of slums and you're lo working on a particular type of slum that is very really different from the type of slum that he's talking yeah, about. That absolutely. those are sort of disposable humanities and mm -hmm. uh, based on day labors. And, and these, I mean, one of the thing, fascinating thing about this space is that um, is the enabling effects that the people actually has the ability to redesign the space and to hold on to it as long as possible, yeah. which give them some kind of hope, you know, uh, leading to certain things. And so, in your presentation, it really doesn't see a strong sense of resentment. In fact, in in in, in your um, description earlier, that you sort of talk about how uh, the people have some pride to show the space, right? And so, I don't know whether that is actually being sort of not being emphasized in the research, or in fact, that's the reality, because I, I kind of think it's probably the second, which is, in a sense, more disturbing, because then mm. it made me wonder, um, is it, let's bring up the whole question about um, governing and self-governing, that, that yeah. I, I wonder whether it's the, the state's inability to police, or the refusal, or the purposely try not to police those uh, particular space, sort of enable people to to decide their own space, mm. meaning sort of to enable the sort of effect of self-governing, mm. which in turn, meaning that produce a kind of political subject that is not totally anti, you know, the current development, despite what's going yeah. on, that all the displacement. So again, as I said, I'm not sure that's a question, but, um, but maybe a side question, so I was also wondering, um, certainly that how does this kind of slum interact with, and I know the mention earlier was not part of the research, um, that the kind of organized um, container temporary housing for construction workers. Mm. But I have also been to, um, along Lower Yangji River, around Shanghai, I have also been to spaces, um, places where migrant workers are actually renting places, yeah. um, not in the city, but, but yeah. like that. And, and I wonder what they've done research, and that, that is yet another type of slum that's, um, Anyway. Yeah, no, this is something we'd actually like to know more about. As Shing said, we've, we haven't had much experience in looking in migrant um, workers' communities. Um, I Actually, from my side, I know a bit more about this just through other people's research and what's happening in Beijing and more about the sort of the policing and the order and the governance questions, which I think is fascinating. There's a book, I forget the name of the author, but the title is Strangers in the City, which is about the, you know, the policing of that. Uh, it's, it's a really, really beautiful study, very detailed and very ethnographically well, well thought through and constructed. But... Um, you know, the, the, slum, the slums thing is very interesting, and I find the Mike Davis approach very interesting and very telling, because, you know, Mike Davis now is the master of disaster. Like, if there's not a, I mean, you know, if there's anything going on around the world that's vaguely disturbing and might sell books, Mike Davis has already written on it. So, I, but what I think is really problematic about Davis's association, as well as Kohlhaas's, um, is this notion that there is something called a slum, that it's a global condition, um, that it has to do with disposability, tragedy, and loss, um, and that it has to do with a kind of a rejection into a world in which you can govern yourself, but it doesn't matter a whit because nobody gives a shit about you. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty worried about that because, and, and this is something that personally irritates the hell out of us because we go and we say, okay, we're studying informal settlements, and then, so we show some people, and they say, oh, this is exactly what's happening in Brazil. This is just like Brazil, which... Uh, or they say, oh, it's just like uh, Africa, it's just like this and that. But actually, this notion that slums are the same everywhere, um, whereas formal architectures are everywhere different, is to me a really problematic notion. I mean, we could say by the same token that, um, that you know, Singapore and New York are exactly the same. They both have buildings. The buildings have doors and windows. They're tall buildings and short. But I mean, that's moronic, right? You would never accept that argument from anyone. But the idea that um, buildings that are produced informally because they're heterogeneous and messy and they're made from low-end materials are thus the same everywhere uh, is, is, is kind of problematic. And I think what, what we're trying to show a little bit in our study is the way that, you know, for whatever reason, even if something we show looks exactly like something that happened in Hong Kong 10 years ago or what happened in, in Lagos five years, it's very different. It's produced within a different nexus of social relations, of, um, of material production, of um, its role bet uh, between uh, a very unique role of a, of, a, of a city that's now engaging an international economy in, in sort of extraordinary ways that by definition already make it a very different experience. Um, and of course, it's being put into a completely different cultural context. So, um, so in that sense, the, 
what we're trying to do is maybe the opposite of a Mike Davis project. I mean, where, whereas we're willing to concede the point that increasingly people are living in informal settlements, I think then the responsibility becomes figuring out how informal settlements, what they are, how they're different one from the next, and you know, what, what do they mean? I, the, the question you were asking in terms of what happens in a moment of governance when people are left alone, um, in many cases when they're not policed, where they're, the responsibility, one of the things that we talk about in the book that's very interesting is how do you make sure that people don't steal all this stuff? I mean, there's no policing in a lot of these buildings in a formal sense. There's private policing, and there are sometimes fake police, both on the real police side and on the local side. It's a very interesting kind of problem with governance. But I think that, you know, engaging those types of issues uh, very specifically here um, has been very exciting. I, I'd love to see people... I know somebody who's, who's talking about very similar... A geographer is dealing with very similar issues um, in, in um, favelas and in Rio. Um, but I, I would like to see increasingly less a series of books telling us that a lot of people are living in slums and more people telling us how. Um, I have a question about sort of your starting point, which if I'm remembering right, was with sort of the image of the construction site fencing. So in the, I, you know, in the talk, we, we were talking a lot about sort of the holdouts and the way that uh, the facades that we usually take as flat surfaces is sort of expand out. But then, of course, after that, the process is, again, one of, of flattening these surfaces. Yeah. And um, in some ways, this is just because I'm very interested in construction site fencing and lots of different ways that screen culture, I think, translates demolition. But I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about the the after the holdout, right? So what happens um, when these become construction sites and mm. when the facade is again returned to a particular type of facade that has a particular function, uh, I think, in Chinese cities and so forth? Um, well, that, that's very interesting. It's something that we were actually just talking about um, on the way in from the airport and driving here this morning. Um, because the nature of that hoarding has been transformed by the uh, run-up to the expo. It's been kind of standardized, it's been beautified. I mean, the, old, the older types of hoarding that we would see after the buildings have cleared, and of course there is this moment of fantasy, right? This is when the scenography unveils and you get these renderings of what you know, the beautiful future is going to look like. And it's, sometimes it's a little bit like you know, the scene in Brazil. Have you seen the movie Brazil where it's driving down the highway and what you get is that Potemkin corridor of just images of you know, kind of happiness and bliss on the side and behind there's smog and destruction. Um, but the, the hoardings used to be almost like informal constructions of their own. I mean, they were built in this kind of weird cobbled together way. The images were borrowed from, you know, you get like a cover of Time magazine stuck to a picture of somebody who's getting a foot massage stuck next. This is kind of wonderful cobbled together iconography. Whereas what's interesting now is it reminds us a lot more of what's happening in Singapore where there are very, um, you know, there, there is kind of a standardized World Expo Shanghai logo, a statement about how things are getting better, and then a rendering of a building that's very realistic and probably will look exactly like that. Um, but, but the formalization of that has been very interesting. It's something we've noticed now. And actually, on the way over, we were remarking about this with a cab driver, and the cab driver was saying, no, no, it's different. He said, before, everyone was doing everything for themselves. You know, they would just do it, they just throw these things up. They say, now, because of the expo, we're all working together. It's an amazing feel. It's like a whole community coming together to build rather than just this guy does this and that guy does that. Um, so what's interesting now for us is that it started to resemble more of a coherent national project or municipal project, whereas before it was really about uh, another series of instantiations where ironically to us what often looked like was that one form of informality was removed and another one was erected in its place. That's sort of what I was wondering about because I've seen a very similar process in Beijing. Yeah. Um. I, I appreciate the detail and nuance of your documentation project. And my, my question is, uh, has to do with what happens after relocation uh, and, and whether you have or will do any uh, follow-up research, either with specific people. Uh, but but a, a larger question, I guess, would be, uh, are there any alternatives to the architectural plan which suddenly uh, you know opens up, doubles the amount of of, of space per individual, the plumbing, all, all the accoutrements that are considered to be an improvement of life um, w without the intangible, you know, idea of what's been lost. And, uh, you know, are there any architectural hybrids that are either smaller spaces in new buildings or less finished spaces that are more affordable? Or, 
or, or is it as it appears in the, uh, in the in the model, the Shanghai model of the planning center, just radiant city for infinity? Yeah. That's an amazing model because I think it took so long to build that it was already outdated by the time it was finished. Um, I, I, you know, I don't, thus far we have been very disappointed in the reaction of individual architects um, in learning about alternative ways to produce a city for themselves and for the inhabitants. I mean, I think that the rush to turn Shanghai into, um, you know, sh uh, Singapore or Taipei, you know, sort of a series of ruthlessly maximized um, condominium units with kind of vestigial landscapes at the ground floor or even worse, kind of shopping podia. I think that's the majority of what we're seeing. Now, having said that, we're absolutely sure that there are a lot of people who are now kind of trying to take this monster and kind of wrangle it into other directions. I mean, a lot of the people we know, there's a younger generation of architects um, some educated in China, some educated abroad and returning now that are hypersensitized to these issues that don't want to see that as the fate of their city and are working very hard at smaller scales. You know, in, for example, the renovation and reconstitution of, of uh, lofts along the river, of buildings that are protected or conserved, but now uh, their status is somewhat up in the air in terms of how they're going to be fitted out and used and, and, um, and appointed later on. So my, my guess is that there are, there are some of these experiments happening. Um, my concern is one of speed and scale. I think that um, the kind of pre-existing deals to create these enormous new um, types of developments and the kind of national level government incentivization um, that has been pushing the production of housing for which there's until recently no market. I mean, a lot of these buildings that were built, they're just, they weren't people, I mean, ironically, you're living in a city that has massive human population density, incredible pressure on housing, and um, is being filled out with housing that the majority of people can't afford to live in, so remain empty uh, for quite some time. Now, that's, of course, will regularize itself. There's an enormous rising Chinese middle class who will buy these apartments and foreigners who will buy these apartments. But um, my concern is that by the time the little players have a chance to do something, um, you know, the, the deed may already been done. I don't know. I mean, but we, we kind of remain optimistic because we tend to think that um, anywhere where there's this amount of energy in rethinking about environments and about urbanism, there are going to be some very interesting experiments that are com coming forward. In terms of the people who've been relocated, I mean, we, we maintain social connections with some of these people, so we know a little bit about what the conditions are like. It's not so much within the scope of the study to sort of describe that, um, but you know, there is a tremendous amount of kind of peri-urban housing that's being built on relatively low end. Um, the only problem is that it's being built without any sense of the production of urbanism. I mean, it's production of architecture without urbanism. They, these buildings just kind of sit there on these enormous carriageways that go from nowhere to nowhere. And, um, and uh, what I'd be interested to know now, actually, is whether that becomes the new frontier for another kind of urbanism where people go back and start, you know, outside of the spotlight of global capital, start remaking their places in interesting ways. I mean, maybe it starts to happen there again. Noticed if anyone, how many people have noticed the parking lot slogan? It's only in Chinese, but it says, This parking lot welcomes the World Expo. Um, <laughs> and for a while I thought I was misreading it, and then I realized that no, it really did say that. Um, but it reminded me of the comment that the cab driver made, and I want to tie together a few things. Um, it basically, it's about the rhetoric of coming together for the World Expo. And the, uh, you know, your cab driver mentioned it this morning. It's also those of you who visited the Urban Planning Exhibition Hall. I mean, that seems to be the main message. It's sort of a mechanism for convincing you, the people of Shanghai, that this is something we, should all, we are all already doing all together, even though you may not have realized it. And here is why we should be doing it all together. So it's this amazing sort of meaning, opinion, producing machine that you move through sequentially. Um, and it's this idea of sort of collective authorship and, you know, take pride in the fact we are doing this together. So I'm wondering if you see relationships or how you see the relationships between that, um, you know, sort of that didactic um, rhetoric and then the types of building practices that are going on in houses. I mean, obviously, there's a huge relationship in the sense of people being displaced, massive transformation of the city, but on the terms of like these micro practices, you know, these ad hoc daily building practices, and then this communal rhetoric of we are working together now, we're not on our own. Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, we have not been around as much in Shanghai since the Expo stuff is really... I mean, the sense of momentum behind this project now is enormous. Um, I, I thought it was going to be a huge flat site. We drove past the site on the way in from the airport, and I was kind of... We were terrified by how much was actually there already um, and how weird and complicated all those bubbles look. But I think that um, 
when we were here, the, the, the sense of the World Expo as something that was looming was not, um, was not really in play. I mean, one thing that was interesting, though, was even within the formal sector, I mean, I don't, I don't think that these people see themselves as challenging necessarily as um, challenging the government in any kind of way to hold out. I think it's just more seen as like, how am I, this is the way it is. You know, I have a, this amount of space, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to have this amount of time, I'm going to make the best of it what I can. But there was an amazing sense in which um, we always felt that people were willing to get behind national projects. Uh, to give you a funny sense, the, the movie Hero, when the movie Hero came out, it was you know, a, a huge hit all over the world. And it was made largely in China um, with some post-production overseas. But what was really interesting is that you could not buy a fake DVD of Hero anywhere in Shanghai. Nowhere. You would go in and say, do you have Hero? They're like, well, we have the real Hero. And he's like, well, but that's like 10 times the cost of that DVD. They're like, yeah, but... That, but they would tell you, this is, this is um, the, the, a Chinese product. We don't, we don't rip this off. You know, you want Hero, you buy Hero. And so all these people who had these massive fake DVD collections were springing out like the extra 10 bucks to buy a copy of Hero, which was being print, you know, pressed somewhere. But, but what was really interesting is there was always a sense that there was an, a fallback to the position of a kind of a national project. So my sense is, I, and I have nothing to back this up, but my sense is that if you ask people who are being relocated um, that they would probably have mixed feelings. They'd probably say, I'm sorry to lose my homes, but at the same time, this is all part of uh, you know, a huge project that in the end is going to benefit China. And we, we did hear sentiments like that at, at certain points. Um, I'm going to be a little obnoxious. Uh, uh, and very quickly, uh, so given what you've said in that question and session, could you say if you think about architectural design, is there something like a southern question? Because, you know, I, I get your point that uh, it riles you that, you know, people put Legos and Sao Paulo and all these different slums together. And I also understand very much your problem with the very word slum because there's something predatory about it. It's an invitation in, to intervene um, violently. But nevertheless, can one think about something like a southern question for architectural design? Um, this, is, this is a really interesting question. I mean, one, one of the things about working in Singapore that's very interesting is this question constantly of identity. I mean, this, this, the, in, the intersection between architecture and identity and southern questions versus northern questions and Asian questions versus western questions are the questions um, I really wish to engage in, I think we both really wish to engage, but we often find them very difficult to do so because we find that the question of architecture as imagery or as iconography often gets in the way of questions of architecture as, you know, as creative and social practices, which is to say that um, what people oftentimes talk about, well, for example, if we take um, South Africa, okay, where people try and now, uh, we were hired by the Bafokeng administration. I don't know if anyone knows who these people are. The Bafokeng are, are uh, um, Tswana people in northern South Africa who own platinum mines and have recently gotten their platinum mines back from the government and now have incredible amounts of money and are trying to figure out what an authentic African architecture looks like. So the king of the Bafo King um, has been flying around various places, including Singapore, saying, uh, I want to meet with people and find out what, what does real African architecture look like, you know? And it was, it was a kind of... <laughs> Well, I mean, he came, and we, we, wrote, we wrote his housing mandate where basically what we said was that um, African architecture has to do with um, a mode of producing architecture, and it has to do with a history of certain kinds of spatial relationships and a social uh, mode of production. Um, it does not have to do with a style or an affect or a way that the building appears. But what was very interesting was that all of a sudden there was a question of what does is, what is a southern architecture look like? Uh, and we'd seen this before um, in that frequently where this was done, it was either done in the style of a kind of a 1950s Latin American modernism, which was half Le Corbusier anyway, frankly, which was coming from South America, or it was being done um, in a kind of Jeffrey Bawa style from Sri Lanka or from, um, from South Asia. But I think for us, um, the question of an architecture from the South is complicated by the fact that a lot of problems we now see in Southern contexts we're seeing in Northern contexts. Um, which to me is fascinating that people will talk about slums, but they don't talk about Detroit, which looks a lot more like Shanghai than it does like New York. It's in the south. It's in the south. <laughs> it's in the very northern tip of the south, <laughs> just below. It's in the south of Canada, I guess. Um, but, 
but you know, but there, but I think what 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 we're seeing now is a kind of a distribution. I, I've always been really worried about the term of the global south. I mean, I think being, you know, a red diaper baby, I always want to bring this back to a kind of a globalized kind of neo-Marxist position where we look at um, a kind of a complex geographical dis production of difference, um, which is now being extra you know kind of extravagantly expanded upon in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, and what would be interesting to me would be to see how. Um, one can get past a kind of a regional identification of that problem and then just start thinking about it in terms of how uh, in many different places in different ways cities are simultaneously decaying and then uh, value is being transferred to elsewhere. I don't know if that answers your question. But well, I was thinking more as not so much as a design but as a problematic, yeah. you know, but applied to architectural design. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that um, the way that architects respond is, is very interesting because they're always looking for context in which to make, you know, make new buildings. Um, but I think that, th that there is. I mean, I think that this, I, I may not imagine it as a sort of a southern problem, but there definitely, if we imagine the southern is not necessarily being in the south, yeah, I think that, the, that they're, it's emerging very, very, very seriously. This is, the, uh, this is the, the talk show question. You mentioned a book, but maybe I've missed the details. Can you tell us about your book? Uh, but sp also, I mean, as well as the publisher, but also specifically, you know, how, what trajectory you take through it. Is it kind of like, um, is it anthropological, or does it like, you know, Kulhas or Venturi slip in a few designs at the end? No. Good question. Um, we, there will be no designs in the end. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we love that old trick of saying, wow, look at what happens in Shanghai, and by the way, we just made this great building that addresses these questions. Um, we're, we're not going to do that. Are we, we are presently, uh, the book, to answer your question, I think it's a kind of a spatialized anthropology rather than anything else uh, with, with drawings, <laughs> okay? Um, which sounds like, like a Frankenstein when I describe it in those terms. I've never thought about it that way before. But I think what we're trying to do often is to take, to understand the way that social practices intersect space in a ver at the scale of architecture, i.e. to try and get away from space in a kind of Lefebvrean you know, abstraction and really talk about spaces rather than space. Um, so what we're doing, and I think you can see a little bit of, of it here, is just to kind of um, try and theorize, try and generate social theory from the empirical, which I'm sure is not stylish, but, um, but works kind of well, we find, when, when we approach um, architecture not as form, um, but as production. So what, what we're doing in each case really is talking about specific instances, specific places, and then trying to use, to, by means of explaining those, try and explain a lot more about what's happening in China at the moment. When we get into questions of policing, social administration, fake industries, um, you know, these, these kinds of public-private inversions that we see. So a lot of it is um, using these, these kind of documented cases as anchors and then kind of expanding outwards. Um, as of now, it's being published by a Singapore publishing house, which is actually a kind of a mom and pop shop, which is friends of ours. But um, you know, we, we have to kind of look into that side of it more because it necessarily it's going to be a very visually heavy book, um, and we're hoping to publish it toward the end of next year. I'm just mentioning this book that I saw uh, by Matthew Mat or Matthew Borosevich, who. He's more an artist than an architect, mm. I think, but also a writer. And he did this book like very uh, thick with a lot of images, mm. more than any text, actually, uh, called Learning from Hong Hangzhou, okay. so very close by to Shanghai, with a, a foreword by Venturi. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprising. I mean, you know, Rem's book on Lagos was going to be called Learning from Lagos. They've changed the title, but... Um I think wisely. But um, one book that I think everyone should look at if you haven't seen it um, is a book by Greg Girard. He's the photographer who actually, for those of you who are from Hong Kong or familiar, he did this incredible book called City of Darkness, which was about the Kowloon Walled City, um, which he documented more than almost anyone else, and he almost got killed doing it a few times. Um, but he's produced a book called Phantom Shanghai, which is a series of photographs of mainly interior spaces, but also the whole kind of, if you're interested in the the kind of the phenomenology of destruction and the question of holdouts. And so I mean, he's made the most sensitive and articulate record of that through his photographs. It's amazing. You should really take a look at it. Can you explain the name? Greg Girard, um, G-I-R-A-R-D. He's a Canadian photographer, um, Phantom Shanghai. And I mean, part of his point, as the title suggests, is that the city is at once kind of spectrally here. I mean, it's periodically here, and it's here, and it's not here. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. 